This podcast is brought to you by the award-winning prop firm, Fidel Crest. I know in my case, the year I took $10,000 to $1.1 million and won the Robins World Cup trading championship. I mean, I was higher than a kite on that. I probably would have been more stable if I was on cocaine or heroin. <laughs> I have yet, after 55 years of doing this, to find incredibly high accuracy and incredible large risk reward ratio. You don't get one, you get one or the other. Everybody wants to jump in this thing and go fast. They see all oh, my students have won the trading championships and they win with three, four, five hundred percent gains or my actor's daughter, Michelle Williams, that took ten thousand to one hundred and ten thousand dollars when she's a sixteen year old kid and they go, Oh, I can do that. Bill always said, Larry, the way you make money in the market I didn't understand this for a while is to have small positions and catch big moves. Well, at that point in my life, I was young. I was trying to, I was betting the farm on every single trade. He said, no, if you have a small position, you can only have a small loss. But that small position can ride a bigger trend move. So your average loss can be three, five, 10, 15 times your, your, your average profit can be five, 10 times your average loss. He said, it's about having a small position so you don't get blown out and looking for and catching major moves relative to your amount of money you could lose. Well, my preferred strategy for the average person, I really have one for stocks and one for commodities. So let me talk about the commodity one. Right here, folks, here we are on Trading Nut. We've got Larry Williams back in the house today after six years. In fact, we're re-releasing the interview that we did six years ago. You're going to find that I'm hopefully better now than I was then. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and I can't believe, like, if you listen to the quotes at the start, I can't believe that I completely missed the fact until three years after the interview that he is the father of Michelle Williams, the famous actress. I, and he even said it in the interview, and I never even knew it. Um, right, after this, we've got, later on in the week, we've got a, another video from a past guest. Derek Vanderlinder is back on. He's having a great winning streak at the moment with one to three R trades. They're sitting up there at, well, when we recorded the video, at 96% win rate from, I think it was the start of this year or late last year. You're going to get to find out not just how he's done it, what he's done, but also see the full strategy as it breaks down in, in its entirety. So we're on there for about half an hour with Derek, so that video's dropping. And a reminder, other things going on here, we've got the live streams happening, we've got a few traders, in fact three of them now, taking on the Fidel Crest 50k challenge. You guys can take part in this as well, there is a link below the video, fill the form in and we'll see if we can get you on. Now one of them has passed phase one already, so that means they've made 5% on the account, the other two are still underway. Um, and we've got a new trader on this week who's looking really promising because he is a funded trader as well. So folks, that's all over there on the live streams. You're going to need to subscribe to the channels for that so you don't miss them when they pop up. Uh, another thing, I spent the day with my new sponsor, Black Bull Markets, last weekend on the back of a boat. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually show you the video shot of me just about to get flipped. So if you're listening to the podcast, then you might want to jump onto the YouTube channel to see this video that we're going to hit play on now. Right, so it wasn't quite flipped, almost flipped. Um, now, the remember, look, these guys are giving away TradingView Pro for free if you sign up with them. They're New Zealand regulated broker, and all you need to do is trade one lot a month, and you're gonna get that TradingView Pro for free. So worthwhile checking them out by clicking the link under the video or in the podcast description. Now, remember, if you're looking for automated solutions, also we've got a bunch of stuff there on TradingNut that I've put together. So if you wanna learn the skills to automate your own stuff, we've got the Robot Builder, Club. Um, if you want to pass funding challenges, there's an auto pass solution there as well. And then we've got a $1 trial. So folks, worthwhile checking those links out underneath the video or in, in the podcast description. Right, enough from me. Let's hear from my sponsor and then get on with this interview with Larry Williams. Fidel Crest is an award-winning prop firm that funds traders with up to $2 million and offers generous profit splits up to 90%. So one thing that really sets Fidel Crest apart is their no minimum trading days requirement on their challenge and verification stages. On top of that, traders who successfully pass the challenge and verification stages are eligible to receive a bonus payout of up to 30K on top of their funded stage profit split payout on performance. And be sure to use promo code TRADINGNUT, all one word, to get 10% off your next challenge. Click the link in the description below or the card above to find out more. Welcome, Larry. Thanks for joining me here on the 52 Traders podcast this week. Oh, my pleasure, Cam. Look forward to seeing if we can have some fun today. Oh, let's hope we do. Okay, so I've already mentioned some of your highlights, and I know that's just a small part of your story. So can you tell the listeners a bit more about you personally and what first attracted you to trading? 
why I was attracted to trading because it looked like easy money. Uh, my dad had worked in an oil refinery and it was hard, dirty, stinky, sweaty work. And uh, when I found out you could make money just buying something that went up, you made a hundred bucks in a day. If the stock went up one point, I go, this is for me. This sure beats refinery work. That was horrible work. So it was really just trying to avoid a job, I think, is what attracted me to it. And, uh, and was there anything that sort of triggered you off in that direction? Was, did you, uh, did you hear about, how did you hear about it? Uh, actually, I uh, asked a guy one day on a newspaper, I pointed at something, he said, most active stocks. I said, this is, uh, I don't know what the stock is, it's up one point. What does that mean? He said, you could have made $100 if you bought it yesterday and got out of it at that price today. And I was in college at the time. Uh, I was an art student and switched to a journalism student because I couldn't draw very well compared to the other people. And I thought, wow, <laughs> this is a hundred bucks, which back in 1962 was, you know, a car, a brand new car cost like $800. So it was a huge amount of money. And I said, this is, I got to figure this one out. Of course, I've been working hard at it ever since. Fair enough. 1962, so you had a number of years of experience under your belt, uh, more than I think almost anyone on the, uh, that I've had on the show to date. Um, right, so for those listening for the first time, we're going to enter around I like to call the fundamentals. So this is where we'll be asking Larry some, to tell us some stories that will help you understand what makes him a successful trader. So can you give the listeners some insight into your trading, your trading style, the strategy you use, time frames, winning percentages, instruments, those sorts of things? Well, to, let's talk about time frames first of all. I think as we all get into the market, we're very short-term time frame traders if you're going to be a trader. And um, it's fun to do that, but it's pretty tough life. Um, so I did it for a while, but now I'm 74 years old. I really don't need another trade. I want a big trade. So at some point in my life, I, I don't recall the exact year, but maybe 1974, I, I had the cognition that technical analysis kind of sucked by itself. There had to be more. I was just looking at charts, and most of the stuff that I read in the books didn't work. And um, and I proved it <laughs> in my own trading account. Yeah. Um, but I realized that conditions move markets. And so I, I'm a conditional trader. I'm not a technical trader. I look for conditions, some are technical, some are fundamental, that I can associate with times in the past when we've seen significant up or down moves. And it, to me, it's all about conditions and then I can put in the technical stuff cam on top of that technical analysis is going to give me trend changes market structure stuff like that but really I think it's a combination of two elements to be a successful trader and identifying your time frame because um, uh, you know when I was young I moved faster than I do now um, some people are sprinters some are marathon runners you have to find what fits you because you can't wear my shoes you got to find what temperaments do you, you, you know, where you are, you're in New Zealand, totally different time frame. You want to trade the American markets. And if you're where I am in the Virgin Islands, so your lifestyle time frame, all, you got to consider all that. You just can't mock up somebody else and think you're going to be instantly wealthy. And, and so looking at the, I suppose he's talking about time frames there. So what, uh, what about like duration of a trade? So you're looking for longer term trades, sort of more investment style, uh, entries or, how does that work? Well, the real key to making a lot of money in the market, an old guy told me, Bill Meehan, who was kind of uh, helped me a lot in understanding the commitment to trader report. Uh, he'd been a member of the Board of Trade, and, and he was the only person that ever knew what this was and taught me about it. And I eventually went on to make my career out of write books about it. But Bill always said, Larry, the way you make money in the market, I didn't understand this for a while, is to – have small positions and catch big moves. Well, at that point in my life, I was young. I was trying to, I was betting the farm on every single trade. He said, no, if you have a small position, you can only have a small loss, but that small position can ride a bigger trend move. So your average loss can be three, five, 10, 15 times your, your, your average profit can be five, 10 times your average loss. He said, it's about having a small position so you don't get blown out. And looking for and catching major moves relative to the, your amount of money you could lose. And that really is the basis of anybody's success in the market, regardless of what strategy they use. And so if we had to sort of dive a little deeper on, on the, on the numbers and stuff. So what, what, what does it look like from a winning percentage and a, um, I suppose, uh, uh, yeah, winning percentages, drawdowns, that sort sure. of thing for you? 
Well, people always ask me about what percentage of my trades are profitable. And that's really probably the last thing that I look at. I'll pull up one of the trading systems we trade right now. And I can tell you, it's a pretty good trading system and uh, its accuracy is high. But whenever you get accuracy, you get another problem. Uh, this trading system trades the S&P minis. And in the last year, it's been 86% correct, which is really great accuracy. But the average profit is about equal to the average loss. So you're always going to get one thing or the other. If you're going to get an average profit 10 times the average loss, which is the ideal thing, your accuracy is going to be maybe 35, 40 percent because you're, you're going to strike out a lot. If you're going to be highly accurate, you're going to get things like I'm doing here in my shorter term trading programs where the risk reward is a, my average win is about equal to my average loss. So I have yet, after 55 years of doing this, to find Incredibly high accuracy and incredible large risk reward ratio. You don't get one, you get one or the other. So the trader has to find the one that fits his emotions. Some people want to be correct a lot of the time. Some don't care if they're ever correct, but they want to catch that one big trade. So again, it's, you know, you don't trade the market. You trade yourself. You trade your personality. And so how many trades would you have running at any one time? Uh, well, I hate to have more than three or four trades. I'm not that good. That I can have 15 trades going on in my mind. Uh, I think you know it's like multitasking. You try to talk on a cell phone and have a cup of coffee and drive. You're going to get in a wreck. Yeah. And my experience and people I worked with, same thing. If you have a bunch of trades going, unless you're a Steve Cohen or some absolutely incredibly brilliant person, uh, the average guy is going to end up in the gutters of the road. And so, um, uh, so I suppose if you if you, you mentioned S and P five hundred, what about sure. other markets? Are you in trading in other markets? Well, I think uh, sure I do. I trade everything. Um, I trade some markets uh, lend themselves to systematic trading. Bonds. I have some automatic bond trading programs, gold programs, uh, crude oil, and e minis, and I just trade them there in a cloud computer, and they just go ahead and trade. I don't know if I'm long or short, and you know, I just let them do what they do. So that's part of my trading strategy, mechanical trading. Then the other part is where um, I'm selective. I look at conditions and find a market that I think is going to have a big up or down move and act accordingly. And do you think everyone should have some sort of uh, algorithmic or mechanical uh, robot working in the background in some markets? Nope. Or no, no, nope. no, nope. no, nope. not at all. Uh, again, and I know this based on uh, research that's been done on traders. Some traders must have a mechanical trading strategy. It fits their personality. Others, you can give them the best winning trading strategy in the world and they'll screw it up because they want to tinker and play with it and they're creative and they, they dance in and out with it. So you have to understand your own temperament and how you approach things. Um, it took me a long time and I had that realization um, that I, I can develop some really great trading strategies, but I, I'd always – twink with them at the last and do things so they weren't as successful as they could be. And finally, when I had that realization that actually my son, uh, who's a psychiatrist, Dr. Jason Williams, did a lot of research on winning traders to see what winning traders had all had in common. Nobody had done research on winning traders before, just losing traders. And that's one of the things Jason found in interviewing these phenomenally successful traders was they all had a trading strategy that fit their personality. Some were mechanical, some were discretionary. But it had to be what worked for them. Oh, that's very interesting. I might have to actually get Jason on the show. By the sounds of it, I was talking about this exactly this exact same thing the other day. So uh, it might be worthwhile getting him on to talk about uh, psychology and just give the listeners a quick grounding because we haven't actually gone into psychology uh, in any detail. And I just had an email come through the other day where somebody was talking about the fact that. It was probably the smallest part of trading in their uh, in their sort of uh, when they look at their trading career, it all sort of came back down to strategy. Um, would you agree with that, or would you disagree with that? Oh no, there's quite a bit of stuff that makes a successful trader. Um, yeah, I'll just prattle away here for a moment. If I start to bore you, jump in. Yeah. But one of the first things people look at money management. I, actually, I didn't look at money management early on in my career because I was I, nobody had written about it. We didn't know what it was about in the 1960s. I had no idea what money management was. That came a lot later. Um, but what I now realize, people talk about money management, but that's not what it is. Money management isn't how you manage your account. 
money management is really your emotional management. Some people can stand to lose $5,000 or 30% of their money on a trade or in a trading strategy. Others can't. So you need to find a money management approach that doesn't drive you wild emotionally. And so for some people, that's a huge risk. For others, it's a small risk. So I can't say, ah, here's the best money management strategy. Ralph Vince has come up with the best money, money management strategy, optimal F. But a lot of people can't trade that because it's, it's not risk adverse. It seeks risk. It, it will always give you the maximum returns, but maximum risk. So you've got to find something that you and maybe your wife are, can live with that, uh, you can still be a normal human being without having this huge, a sucker punch of emotions that the market can give us. Right, folks, I'm here at the Black Bull Markets headquarters up in Auckland, New Zealand, and I'm standing in front of their whiskey bar. Now, if you like that kind of selection, you're going to love their 26,000 tradable assets from Forex, cryptos, indices, stocks, you name it, they've got it. So, folks, go and check them out at blackbullmarkets.com or click the link under the video or in the card above. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, do you, do you think there's a is there a sort of special? I think we'll get this into a, into this a bit later in the show. But is there a special technique that you've come across, or a common technique to to get around that sort of emotional connection to money? You, well, no, I I think we all uh, money means a lot because we work for it and it, and it shows that we're losing things. Um, most of us, I know in my case, the year I took $10,000 to $1.1 million and won the Robbins World Cup trading championship. I mean, I was higher than a kite on that. I probably would have been more stable if I was on cocaine or heroin. Because <laughs> what it does to your personality, I was just a horrible person. Not that I've ever been that good of a person, but you just get so damn full of yourself. And, and so the emotions, you can be, it's manic, really. You can be manic or you can be depressive. And it really is the amount of money. The, the other thing that I've learned in my trading, I don't mind losing thirty, forty thousand dollars in a trade uh, as a, it's as a percentage of my bankroll. It's not even two percent. But it took me a long time to, to handle the dollar amount. It wasn't a percentage of risk. But when I grew up, we were dirt poor. Our house cost ten thousand dollars. So if I lose ten, fifteen thousand dollars in a trade in a day. I have a lot of like, geez, Larry, you know, this, what are you doing here? Uh, it was just a dollar amount. So that's me. That's probably different for everybody. But you have to find that um, internal point in yourself where the dollar amount and the percentage of risk you can live with. Then you can take anybody's money management strategy and insert your personality into it, and you'll have a strategy that fits you. Okay. And uh, so what does your typical trading day look like these days? Well, uh, it's kind of unusual. Um, my typical trading day really begins about now. The markets just close, and so as soon as we're through with this, I'll start working on the markets, figuring out what positions, if any, I'm interested in. I'll place my orders tonight, and uh, then I really won't look at the markets too much until tomorrow afternoon when the markets close. And that's really what I learned when I was living uh, in Sydney. Australia, uh, because of the time zones, I would place my uh, trades about 10, 11 o'clock at night, go to bed, wake up in the morning, gingerly walk over to my computer to see how many things I've been stopped out of, about what I'd lost or made, open it up and kind of peek at it. Like, oh, what happened? Like Christmas morning every morning. And I learned from that not to interact with the markets. It was really a, a grandly helpful experiment. So I still more or less trade that way. I seldom will will call a trade during the day. I know I know tonight what I want to do tomorrow. If I don't, I shouldn't be trading. Okay. Might might be helpful for me living on the in this side of the world as well. Yeah, uh, you're in a great great place to learn to trade. Because you don't worry about stops, you place your stops. You know, it's there. You don't have to oh, are they going to get me? What's going to happen? All that yada yada mental stuff is gone. You go to bed. Have a nice glass of Shiraz from uh um, Australia and go to sleep or have a, a great uh, Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. Yeah, indeed. Right, so in the beginning, what do you think differentiated you from the average ma mum or dad trader out there? I mean, what traits did you have and what actions did you take? Well, I think uh, one of my strengths is that when I take IQ tests and all that stuff, I'm not up there very high. 
which means I have to overcome that by working harder. So I think that I've worked really hard at what I do. I, I probably have some natural gift for it uh, because it's always been something that's easier for me than other people. So that would be one thing. Also having really inspirational people in my life, Bill, me and I mentioned Tom DeMarc, who's been a phenomenal, absolutely incredible friend and supporter for so many years and such a creative guy that I've learned a lot from and learned how to learn, how to look. Um, so, you know, my friends in the market have, uh, you know, been just phenomenal friends. and We've all shared ideas, Vic Niederhofer, share ideas about the markets. That's helped. And, the, you know, I played football in college, and the, the idea there is you got to persevere through pain. And I've run a lot of marathons, 80 marathons, and the same thing there. And that's like trading. You're going to have pain if you're going to trade. And you better pre-frame yourself in advance in a marathon, mile 18, 20, 25. They're going to be pretty ugly. So when you get there, you don't collapse. Go, oh, yeah, okay, I was, I'm was, i ready for this. And the same thing with trading. You're going to have some ugly days. So you, you need to be emotionally, intellectually ready for that. Okay. So if, if you're a retail trader working your day job, what steps would you take to start earning income? <laughs> Ask my boss for a raise. I said, well, <laughs> Sorry, as a trader. <laughs> earning income as a trader. Yeah. Oh, oh as a trader. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I wouldn't day trade because you can't. You can't be loyal to your boss. You can't ride for the brand and day trade. You're going to be so screwed up watching your little five-minute stupid charts. You're not going to be a good employee, so don't day trade. Learn conditions that move markets. Uh, learn uh, to be an end-of-the-day trader. Uh, learn to not bet so big that your emotions uh, get in the way of your job performance. And uh, go slow. Everybody wants to jump in this thing and go fast. They see all my students have won the trading championships and they win with three, four, five hundred percent gains. Or my actress daughter, Michelle Williams, that took ten thousand to one hundred and ten thousand dollars when she was a sixteen year old kid. They go, oh, I can do that. And well, you know, we really focused on those years and and um, these massive gains are are. Um, an unreal goal for most people. So you should have a realistic goal. If you can do 30, 40 percent a year, you're knocking it out of the park in this business. If you can consistently do that, only well, I think one or two people have done that that manage funds ever in the history of the world. So, you know, have realistic goals. And so, and so if they were going to sort of go somewhere for learning, I mean, what, what would be your advice in this day and age for trying to find somebody or something to learn from? What would you recommend? Oh, I'd recommend that you don't do that. Uh, I'd recommend you look at charts. You read books. Go to the library. As Ronald Reagan said, uh, trust but verify. A lot of these books are just hooey. They say things that really aren't real, but you can check it. You can look at your charts and go back and see, well, is this really right or not? And then try it in the future on paper to see if it works. So I think a lot of it is a self-learning experience. Sure, people like me have courses and classes, and my students do pretty well at it. But – I tell all of them, you know, the more didactic, uh, self-learned you are, the better you will be. So I would just say from what I can tell, and this is an old man's view, there's all these Forex people out there. With, they're all making millions of dollars in two days or whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's really doing that in real-time trading. So just be careful. Uh, you know, that's all I'd say. And, and you know, from my perspective – uh, technical analysis is one of the elements. It's not the only element. You really have to put three or four elements together. There's no one be-all, end-all answer to the market. Okay, and can you explain to the listeners your preferred trading strategy, so the ins and outs of how it works and why you chose this strategy over others? Well, my preferred strategy for the average person – I really have one for stocks and one for commodities. So let me talk about the commodity one is I use weekly charts and I don't have very many indicators. I think most people have way too many indicators in their charts. My percent R is the same as stochastic, which is the same as Bollinger Band B, which is the same as MACD. They're all doing the same thing. They're just massaging numbers. The, the, the results are about the same. So I have very few indicators in my charts. What I have are indicators like the commitment of trader report. Uh, insider buying, insider selling, uh, commercials, real real money being going into the marketplace, 
the seasonal factors in the market, spreads, which are huge in commodities. So those are fundamental considerations. I look at those to get a market that I think is set up to move. And I've got six or seven of those criteria. There's just a couple that I name. Then once I find those criteria, I then can turn to my technical work and I would look for my percent R to help me identify an overbought, oversold area. I'd look for trend lines or a volatility stop uh, as an entry in the marketplace to say, oh, yeah, the trend is now up, which is what the condition suggests. So I can now get into the marketplace. That's really a thumbnail sketch of how I do what I do. Okay. Cool. Thanks for that. And uh, if you had to split split your trading into technical versus fundamental, what would it look like? I couldn't do one or the other. And sorry, I mean, from a percentage point of view, what what would it look like? Like eighty percent technical, twenty percent fundamental? Oh. Um. Well, I would say it's probably eighty percent fundamental and twenty percent technical. Because it's all about finding the right market and then the right time comes from the technical. So it's like going hunting. You kick up a lot of bushes looking for birds or deer and you don't see anything. So you're out in the field a lot until you get to pull the trigger and shoot. Or like fishing, same thing there. So it's probably, uh, I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. It's probably 80% what I would call fundamental. Okay. And so if you were, uh, I suppose, a novice trader looking at for fundamentals, what three things would you recommend they look for? Commitment to trader report would be the first one. And there's a lot of variations of that. I've written a book about it called uh, Trading with the Insiders. First book ever written about it. Um, I look at seasonals. I think seasonal factors are relatively consistent and are important in the marketplace. I would look at premiums or spreads to see if a market is developing a premium. Uh, in the natural resource commodities, uh, is incredibly important when markets go into premium. It means the uh, commercials want the product and the market is extremely bullish and you really want to look for buys. So those would be the, the first three things that I would look for. And seasonals, well, I've not heard of seasonals before. How do you go about finding those? Well, most uh, charts uh, now have seasonal indicators. Another one of the first, I was the first person to write a book about seasonal influences in commodity and stock prices way back in 1973. And basically what we do is we grind all the numbers together so we can tell you when um, uh, the SPY in Australia usually rallies and declines. Uh, typically, uh, the bond market in America starts to rally in about six or seven days from now. There's been a strong seasonal influence for that. We usually rallies this time of the year, things of that nature. So by developing a seasonal indicator, we know when the best time usually has been to uh, buy gold. But that doesn't mean it will be this year. We still have to get to that seasonal sweet spot and then look at the other stuff. But it's a great advance warning. Like, oh, we better look for gold to buy now because usually year in and year out, the last 25 years, it's rallied here. Should do it this year. But let's confirm it with some other tools. Okay, cool. And so if they were looking at a uh, – from talking from a technical perspective, if a novice trader was looking at a price, price chart, what three things would you recommend they educate themselves on? <laughs> uh, well, I don't look at price charts, so I don't know what to tell you. Oh. I don't use candle. I don't use candlesticks. No, the price is very deceptive. If you look at price, it'll go crazy. I look at the conditions that cause price to move. The last thing I look at is price. I want to look at the things below the market that makes the market move. If you look at today and yesterday, there are 28 relationships between yesterday's open high low close and today's open high low close. 28. Maybe there's more, but that's all. I found that many. So if you multiply that by five or six days, there's so much stuff for your mind to look at that you get all wrapped up in it. The only thing I look at charts for is to find signs of high emotions when people's emotions are wildly bullish. And then I want to fade that wild bullishness. If you have a, a market that's up, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, Crude oil yesterday, you got the date on this so your people can take a look at that. Uh, let me bring up my chart here. Where is my crude oil chart? Crude oil had what looked like it broke out really well yesterday. There it is. And then um, uh, today it came right back down. Yeah, it broke it yesterday. So we're looking at the uh, – Whatever yesterday, uh, the 19th day of October 2016, crude oil 
had new high clothes, broke out of congestion range, looked really bullish. I go, it should be. But if it fails the very next day, well, that's that's a setup for yourself. There's a good example of it. Tired of missing trades or spending hours at the charts? Introducing my Robot Builders Club. With our platform, you can build bots in minutes, not weeks, without any coding required. Get lifetime access to my video course, VIP community, and over 40 ready-made robots. Works with MT4 or MT5, and as a bonus, you'll get three months access to my robot lab, where we build and test bots on live calls every week. Join the hundreds of traders who are trading smarter, not harder. Click the link in the description to learn more, get the free training, and download a free robot. Cool. We can jump on there and uh, have a look at that, guys. I might even chuck it in the show notes. So um, let's move on to the next part of the show. So this is where I'm going to talk. Uh, it's called the technicals. I'm going to run through 12 quickfire questions to help the listeners out there understand what it takes to become a successful trader. So are you ready for us there, Larry? Bring it on. Righty-ho. So how long did it take you to go from a trading newbie to consistently profitable? Uh, consistently profitable, maybe six years. What's your mental approach to trading and what special techniques do you use to keep your emotions in check? Don't bet too big. The bigger the bet, the bigger the emotion. That's real simple. So most people are betting if they're getting emotional. It's not because their mother didn't breastfeed them or they got spanked as a kid or whatever. They probably should have been spanked. The reason they're too emotional is the bet size is too big for their emotions. So if you're getting overly emotional in the market, it's not you. It's not your psychologically dearranged. It's that your bet size is too big for your emotions to amount your risk. So cut back your risk. And quickly, what's your favorite entry setup? Oh, I actually don't have a favorite. I have several. I think, well, I know the markets don't always top and bottom the same way every time. So you have to have um, a, a variety of techniques to get you in. You have to have a bunch of arrows in your quiver. Uh, so I don't think there's any one that I would say, oh, this is the be all. And, you know, this is like fighting. You have to be, protect yourself at all times and look for opportunities. So I, w I will use things like trend lines, though. I like those. I'll use little patterns in the marketplace. I'll use momentum studies. Um, so, you know, I'll use a seasonal uh, stuff as well. So I, I really have a variety of techniques. Um because the markets don't top and bottom the same way every time. And what strategies do you use to exit or manage active trades? To manage my active trades? Yeah. Uh, well, I really don't pay much attention to them. I think most people um, get so close up to their trades that they dance around, they get in, two out, they get whatever they don't do because they're watching every tick on the marketplace. You know, I'm so fortunate living here in the beautiful Virgin Islands. I might go for a swim in the morning. I'm not going to look at the markets much. The markets are going to do what they're going to do. Me looking at the market, will that change what the market does? Nope. In fact, it will probably draw me in, lure me in to make a wrong decision during the day. So, uh, you know, I, I place my stops. I have my targets and trade's over. So I'm going to win, lose, or draw. What's your recommended must-read trading book? Must read trading book, uh, the best trading book in the entire world. There's no book better than this book. It's going to be the book you write yourself. The book where you record your daily observations about the market, your thoughts before, where you're going to buy or sell, then your follow up commentary on the market, what happened, why the trade worked, why it didn't work, why you could have bet more, why you shouldn't have bet more, all those things. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than the reading the best 100 books ever written in the marketplace. That's probably the that, best, best answer I've had for this question. <laughs> yeah, that that notwithstanding, the best – there's a couple of best books. The one that I think is so so uh, insightful is called Zurich, like the town in Switzerland, Zurich Axioms by Max Gunther. And it's not going to tell you to buy pork bellies tomorrow, but just drip with wisdom – and uh, thinking about the markets. I tried to buy the rights for it, but somebody picked them up, and the, the book is now available. It's out of print for quite a few years. Uh, but that's that's been certainly a marvelous book. Um, on money management, you have to read Ralph Vince's books. Without a doubt, he's the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. Um, technical analysis, Tom's stuff, Tom DeMarc's stuff. My stuff, you can probably get at the library, and so you don't have to buy it. Um, 
Jake Bernstein's got some good stuff out there. Uh, you know, you got to find a teacher that teaches the way you learn. So that's important. If you go to a guy named Larry Pesavento, I got an email from Larry today. If you understand how he teaches, then you can learn his stuff quickly. So whenever you come into a teacher, if you go, wow, I don't quite understand this, it's probably not the material, it's his teaching style. So you have to have a teacher where you go, oh, I got it, I see what he's doing here. That's going to help you be a better learner. Cool. I'll hook those, uh, all those books up. We'll go and find a whole, whole bunch of books from those uh, authors. Chuck them in the show notes. So, guys, if you want to jump on there, you can have a look and uh, and find those, um, or you can jump down to your library and see if you can find Larry's book. Um, so if there was one thing you would recommend any retail trader spend the next month mastering, what would it be, why, and how could you go about mastering it? Mastering something in trading? Yeah. For Over the next month, what would be the one thing that you could – Recommend you mean like a tra- like a trade, like a trade or a trait to work on? A trait to work on or a, uh, a specific aspect to trading, so uh, something that they could go away and, and work on mastering. Sure. Humility. Humility. Do you want to expand Humility. on that one quickly? The greatest traders that I know, and I know guys that are worth billions and billions of dollars, uh, okay. if you were to meet them, you would be shocked at how um, – underconfident they are, how humble they are, how pleasant they are to be around. The movies have the image of the Wolf of Wall Street where people shouting and yelling and screaming and buy New York, South Chicago, blah, 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 all that. That's not the real world. The real world of these guys that are such phenomenal traders is they their confidence level is not nearly as high as you would expect. And that's probably why they're such good traders because they don't get overconfident. So, yeah, uh, even if you're not a trader, I think if you can work on humility, I'm having troubles with that myself. So I tried to work on it. Um, but I think humility makes for very good traders. I heard a good quote the other day, uh, be humble, be happy. So if that's something you want to um, remind yourself of, guys out there, it might help you with your humility. So what trading-related internet resource like Bloomberg.com do you always use? Uh, well, I, I use TradeStation, um, because I have a lot of my indicators in TradeStation, all my commitment to trader report stuff is there. My true seasonal is there. So I've got all my indicators in TradeStation. I can place my orders there. This is an interesting question that used to be in the old days. We had software companies that we could look at the markets with, and then we had brokers where we placed our orders. And when I grew up, of course, we called brokers with the orders. Uh, now we have software and we have brokers, but we have some where the bro- uh, broker and the software have come together. Mm. So that's one-stop shopping, and I like that. I have the software from them. I place my order on their platform, and it's a done deal. So I really like one-stop shopping in terms of the software that I use, but I use TradeStation. Uh, what's the biggest mistake most retail traders make? To start trading. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, overconfidence, I guess. Um, you know, thinking they can do it. Um, you have to be optimistic in this business, but you can't be too optimistic, that's for sure. And thinking that charts move the markets. Charts don't move the markets. Conditions move the markets. Prices go from A to B, from say 50 to 100 because of conditions. They dance around. That's the technical, emotional part of the market. In other words, technical stuff is really emotional stuff. But the conditions cause prices to move. Charts don't cause prices to move. Cool. Interesting. And, and if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, what would it be? Probably not listen to Larry Williams. I don't know how good my <laughs> advice is, you know. And there are a lot of, a lot of people out there that have been a lot better at this than me. Um, uh, just don't overtrade. Uh, don't try to become a day trader. There, you know, we've created a lot of really consistently successful traders, um, end of the day traders who wait for conditions, understand that charts don't move markets and look for trend changes and ride trends and keep your stops in there and don't get paranoid. Don't think they're out to get you. They don't even exist. And just be a disciplined trader um, and have it a strategy that you've proven works. Uh, and then don't get too emotional. In other words, watch your money management. That's really kind of uh, in a nutshell what I w- would suggest to anybody. 
Okay, cool. So the last question of the show, we'd like you to give us the bones of a full trading strategy. So the entry setup, stop loss, take profit targets, market time frame, something our listeners can try out at home. What have you got for us there, Larry? Oh, boy. Uh, my my uh, automatic trading strategies are too complex. Um, to uh, give you because they're pretty sophisticated. So I'm dragging my feet here telling you how I can give you one. Um, we just need the sort of bones. So like you don't need to go into all the detail, just uh, just a structure is, is fine. Sure. The structure would be, I would, I'm again, I'm a conditional trader, okay? So I'd like to find this condition in the marketplace, a high level of open interest, and then I'm going to look at the commitment of trader report and see that that high level of open interest has been caused by the small speculators and the large traders. And while that open interest has been increasing, the commercials have been selling the market. Now, that's a beautiful setup for a sell signal. So that's the condition. Then the entry is going to be from a trend line or any arrow that you guys and gals have in your own quiver. I think our guys can work out. Have a look at that. Um, before we wrap up, what's the best way for my listeners to get hold of you? Uh, well, our website is IReallyTrade.com. I think we might have some free stuff on there. I don't know. I'm uh, I'm going to retire next year at 75, so we really started to pull back quite a bit, and I'm looking for the off-ramp, so I don't know how much stuff is there, but you go to IReallyTrade.com. There might be some free lessons and stuff there and some commentary. Uh, we do have a mailing list. If you get on it, we send out interesting things. Uh, we don't do promotion. We're not a, you know, try to sell you stuff type of thing. Uh, we, we, if we see something interesting, we'll let you know. But we're, you don't have to be afraid we're going to spam you or anything like that. That doesn't happen. We trade both my wife. My wife has been an incredibly successful trader, so we, we really trade. All right, folks, there you have it, interview done and dusted. Now, I, I thought I completely screwed the interview up, but Larry managed to pull it together and give some fantastic answers. I'm actually going to try and reach out and see if I can get his son on uh, and some of those guests he mentioned in the books. And what we'll do is we'll link up the books in the show notes again. Uh, folks, do remember other things going on here at Trading Out. We've got those live streams for you. We've got the Fidel Crest Challenge. You can enter that. Uh, we've got Derek van der Linder's video coming up later this week. We've got the Black Bull Markets Trading View Pro offer. And do also remember to check out those robot links. So there's all sorts of stuff. I think six or seven, one dollar trial all the way through to building your own bots. Uh, it's all over there on Trading Nut. Links under the video or in the podcast description. All right, that's enough from me. Thank you for listening and watching. We'll have a fantastic brand new interview for you next week, so stay tuned.